I'm going to start it in three, two, and one. Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Podcast. I am with a very special guest today, Dr. Michael Hamblin. Uh, Dr. Hamblin is a principal investigator at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine at Massachusetts General Hospital, an associate professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School, and a member of the affiliated faculty of Harvard MIT Division of Health Science and Technology. He was trained as a synthetic organic chemist and received his PhD from Trent University in England. His research now uh, is broadly in the area of phototherapy for multiple diseases. Uh, one focus is the study of new photosensitizers for infections, cancer, and heart disease. And a second focus is low-level light therapy or photobiomodulation for wound healing, arthritis, traumatic brain injury, psychiatric disorders, and hair regrowth. Dr. Hamlin has published over 289 peer-reviewed articles, over 150 conference proceedings, book chapters, and international abstracts, along with holding eight patents. You've done a lot, Dr. Hamlin. How do you get time for all this stuff? Quite a lot more now. I'm pushing 500 peer-reviewed papers. Oh, that my gosh. Quite an outdated <laughs> list. I don't worry about it. It's not worth getting obsessed on numbers. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I want you know to start off just by, if you could just kind of explain, well, there's a few different terms, I guess, but if you could explain like low-level light therapy versus photobiomodulation, just for, say, someone who's maybe heard of it before but doesn't know exactly what those mean. How would you explain it? Okay, so it's been known for thousands of years that you can get pronounced therapeutic effects by exposing uh, yourself or somebody else to light. And for most of that time, it was sunlight because people would go out into the sun and it produced all sorts of benefits. But these were never really scientifically studied until relatively recently. Um, in the early part of the uh, 20th century, there were a lot of people built clinics in the Alps for heliotherapy, and people would go, and you see rows of people lying in beds outside in the sunshine in the Alps. Um, the next sort of milestone came with the discovery of the laser in 1960. And soon after that, people started to find that shining laser beams onto all sorts of parts of the body produced remarkable effects and wound healing, hair regrowth, um, pain reduction, and reduction of inflammation. Those were the main things people found with lasers. So for you know, 30, 40 years, there were laser therapists that would shine lasers on various parts of the body. Um, they had to take laser safety training courses because mm. people were worried about damaging eyesight and other things with lasers. But then in the uh, you know, last 10, 15 years, the introduction of LEDs, light emitting diodes, made another sea change in this. So, you know, now instead of going to a laser therapist and having a, a laser shone on you, you can get various kinds of LED arrays and you can shine them on yourself. Um, so this is why the field decided to adopt the term photobiomodulation, because low level laser therapy, you know, was designed for lasers and it distinguished between low level lasers and high intensity lasers that could cut tissue and burn things. So that was where the low came in. But low is a, a, a relative term. How do you define low? You know, it depends what your frame of reference is. Um, and also a lot of the applications of photobiomodulation involve stimulating things, but others involve inhibiting things. So harmful processes you want to inhibit, 
um, other things you want to stimulate. So you want to inhibit pain, you want to inhibit inflammation and so forth, but you want to stimulate healing, stimulate tissue regeneration and so forth. So that's where the modulation came in. It can both stimulate and inhibit. And we got rid of laser. So fetabiomodulation is now the internationally accepted term. Okay, that actually makes some more sense. And then why, why should most people care about photobiomodulation? What are the, what are, you know, we kind of touched on a little bit, some of the applications, but can you tell me a little more about kind of the scope of, of different conditions or, or I think I've heard something about now, like as far as peak performance or athletes starting to use photobiomodulation? Right, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of reasons why photobiomodulation is catching on. So it has virtually no side effects. I mean, it's almost impossible to shine too much light on yourself. I mean, maybe it could be done, but really for all intents and purposes, there's no side effects, no dangers. It's also drug free. An awful lot of people, you know, are against big pharma and this creeping encroachment of, of drugs for every every ill and condition which produce a lot of side effects themselves. So undoubtedly some drugs are useful and save lives, but you know there's a feeling that the pharmaceutical industry is just encroaching too much. So you know but a biomodulation of physical therapy which is harmless. It's LEDs are relatively in, inexpensive. Um, some time ago, lasers were quite pricey, but now LEDs cost virtually nothing. And you can use them at home. So you can have an LED array to put on your head or around your knee or on your muscles or your wrist or any part of the body that you think needs some, uh, you know, reduce pain, reduce inflammation, stimulate healing. So it's very versatile, inexpensive, safe, no side effects, and doesn't involve drugs. So why wouldn't you use it? That <laughs> makes sense to me. How about, what do we know about uh, photobiomodulation as far as hormones go in both men and women? Well, uh, that that's, hasn't been studied to any huge extent. I mean, I've certainly seen a few people talking, as you say, about testosterone. Um, presumably, they're putting the light actually on the genitals to increase testosterone. Um, female hormones, again, you know, people are starting to talk about photobiomodulation for, uh, you know, assisting reproduction, for certainly has a big effect on male sperm for sure and a, a lot of people have done that it stimulates the movement and get more likely to get fertilization and so forth um, I mean you know other hormones have been talked about more in a systemic idea so certainly photobiomodulation reduces blood sugar um, it may stimulate insulin sensitivity um, melatonin uh, certainly increases melatonin, so it's good for sending you to sleep if you use photobiomodulation before bedtime. Does it make a difference uh, as far as where you're using it, as far as getting the, the benefits, as far as the melatonin you mentioned? Uh, okay, so you can... Uh, you know, if you use blue light in the morning, it suppresses melatonin. That's fairly well known. And that's mainly shining it on your face. So the photoreceptor for blue light is in the eyes. Um, for increasing melatonin with red near infrared light, you can probably use it anywhere on the body, actually. So that effect is not necessarily mediated through the eyes. But it doesn't harm to shine red near infrared light on your face or into your eyes. It's actually good for your eyesight it will uh, you know um help the retinal function and uh, all sorts of things interesting and then what about as far as uh you mentioned like the the blood sugar reduction and possible increase in insulin sensitivity uh in those studies did they 
uh, shine the light at a specific region of the body or is that just kind of a systemic effect? Well, it probably is a systemic effect. Certainly shining it on the big muscles and the thighs and the back and so forth um, consumes a lot of glucose because the muscles are rich in mitochondria. You can also shine light on the belly, which seems to affect the sort of fat in the belly. And, you know, the systemic inflammation you get from fat is bad for insulin resistance. One of the reasons why obese people get type 2 diabetes. Um, so you can shine it on the muscles to consume more glucose, lower blood sugar, but you can probably shine it on the belly to reduce the systemic inflammation from the fat. Interesting. Okay, I, I want to transition a little as far as now talking about kind of photobiomodulation and the brain. Um, as far as what do we know as far as how, how does light impact the brain and kind of how are we able to alter uh, uh, brain chemistry or metabolism with light therapy? Well, I think light has a remarkable effect on the brain. Again, you know, the brain is stuffed full of mitochondria, although it's only 4% of the body weight, it uses 20% of the oxygen and the glucose, so it's the most active organ in your body. And photobiomodulation increases the mitochondrial function. And a lot of brain disorders are characterized by mitochondrial dysfunction for a whole number of reasons. So you get more oxygen consumption, you get more ATP, you get increased blood flow delivering uh, the oxygen and the glucose. Um, so, but this is a relatively short-term effect. I think the, the exciting thing is the long-term effect. So there's a lot of evidence that photobiomodulation stimulates the cortical neurons to form new connections which is synaptogenesis, and even to form more cells. So there are neuroprogenitor cells in the brain, in the uh, hippocampus, in the uh, subventricular zone. So you get more new brain cells formed. And a lot of brain disorders are characterized by reduced neurogenesis. You know, so obviously if you've had a stroke or a head injury, you need to get some new brain cells to repair the ones that have been damaged. But, you know, obviously Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, all the neurodegenerative diseases and even psychiatric disorders are characterized by reduced neurogenesis. Interesting. So are the, are the few main mechanisms, it sounds like, so increasing neurogenesis, increasing uh, synaptogenesis, and improving the health of the mitochondria, is that primarily how you think that uh, brain photobiomodulation is working to treat these conditions? No, I think a, a, another very important thing is neuroinflammation. So, you know, having excessive inflammation in your brain is really bad for you. And it, again, it's characterizes a lot of brain disorders. And as we know, photobiomodulation is anti-inflammatory. It switches, you know, the microglia in the brain from M1, which are bad inflammatory microglia, to M2, which are anti-inflammatory, but also they clear the sort of rubbish out of your brain. So if you've got amyloid plaque or something, switching the microglia to a phages cytic phenotype can clear the plaque. Um, it's also antioxidant. So oxidative stress in your brain is bad. And it's known that photobiomodulation upregulates antioxidant defenses like superoxide dismutase and glutathione reductase and all these well-known antioxidants. Uh, so anti-inflammatory and antioxidant, I think, uh, very important in the brain. Right. So, and then, so it's kind of like, uh, we know all of these things happen. So whoever is using it, these things are going to happen. And then the benefits could be kind of whatever this person may be, uh, 
you know, dysfunctional in? Is that kind of how you see it as far as being able to treat, you know, from traumatic brain injuries all the way, you know, to psychiatric conditions? What has like traditionally there's been a very, you know, different approach between the two, but it sounds like this, um, this sort of methodology of, of going about treating with light therapy is kind of, it, it kind of produces similar effects in people. Is that correct to say? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, you can treat normal, healthy people by putting near infrared light on their head. And there's some evidence that helps them do cognitive tests, you know, sort of psychological tests. And certainly it makes people sleep better for sure. No question. So if you have problems sleeping, you know, putting some near infrared light on your head before you go to bed is going to help. And a lot of, you know, brain problems are characterized by poor sleeping, actually. You know, it's, people think it's like curse of the modern age, right? That nobody gets enough sleep because they're <coughs> obsessed with their electronic devices and all this. So, uh, um, and then, you know, as you get older, you know, your memory is not what it was. I know my memory is not <laughs> what it was <laughs> 30 years ago. So uh, put a near infrared light on my head. And I think it helps. Interesting. So how, I'm curious, how do we actually get the light to, how, how does it actually penetrate the brain? I've seen different, uh, you know, certain companies using like intranasal applications versus, you know, just putting it like a, a sort of a headset thing on how, like how is light able to to penetrate through to the brain right as you say there's a lot of devices out there and they vary a lot between fairly low powered devices that you would put up your nose 10 milliwatts or a headset which is a couple of hundred milliwatts but you can get helmets which have many watts of optical power like you know, if you put 10 watts of optical power over your head, that wouldn't heat you up at all. It's pleasantly warm. It's certainly not, not going to heat you at all. And, you know, some of that penetrates through the hair, through the scalp and through the skull. Not a lot, maybe one or two percent, something like that. If you put the light on the forehead, there's no hair there. So that's one barrier gone. Um, and also the frontal cortex is involved in, you know, higher order cognitive functions. So it's probably good to get some light there. But, you know, because a lot of people are uncertain precisely which parts of the head you should put the light on. I think it makes sense to just have a helmet that covers the whole head and not worry too much about, you know, which parts of the brain you're actually trying to get the light to but there again other people do think it's important to target certain areas of the brain interesting yeah because i i work in the sort of um neurotech field working with like qeeg um, and different sort of neurostimulation technology and it's interesting because we kind of base the a lot of the protocols off of what we you know in the brain map um you know, kind of which regions we see dysfunction in, in, in various frequencies. And then we kind of target, you know, the therapy to really hit those regions. So it would be interesting, like if, you know, if say someone had a, had an injury, a uh, traumatic brain injury that, you know, where they got, you know, hit in the head, uh, you know, and their temporal lobe uh, got damaged, would it, do you think it would work to just shine light directly on that area of the brain? Well, the, the one person that's done some research in this is Marnie Naser, and what she found is that patients who had unilateral strokes, you wanted to shine the light on the damaged side of the head, not the normal side. Interesting. Uh, but, you know, certainly this needs more study to find out if the areas of the head on which you're putting the light are indeed critically important. You know, I mean, photobiomodulation is much more general than, say, transcranial magnetic or TDCS or something like that, where you, it's known you can get 
action potentials where you put the, the non-invasive brain stimulation, right? I mean, this is, doesn't really happen with vertebrae modulation. You know, if you put a, a near infrared light on your head, if there's enough power, you can feel something after about five minutes. You generally get a feeling of euphoria and well-being. So it feels quite good. But I don't think it's precise as, for instance, transcranial magnetic. Right. What about, what do you think as far as um, the, the photobiomodulation kind of with the various kind of inducing various brainwave states? Like I've seen um, some devices kind of generating a, a 10 hertz alpha, alpha rhythm um, versus other ones that I think are more, you know, geared towards trying to treat Alzheimer's where it's actually, I believe there was a paper published about a 40 hertz uh, sort of gamma oscillation induction with with light therapy um do you know about that yeah sure so this all started with a, a high profile paper from mit where they used blue light pulsed at 40 hertz into the eyes and they found that the actual frequency was pretty important so if it was 10 hertz or 100 hertz, it didn't work anything like as well as if it was 40 hertz. And as you say, this was an Alzheimer's model. So when you shine blue light in the eyes, it's transduced by the optic nerve to the super um, charismatic nucleus and so forth, which is well known. But it's the, their hypothesis was it was the gamma rhythm of 40 hertz that was stimulated. So then the people that are doing transcranial photobiomodulation with near infrared light argued that they could do 40 hertz as well and stimulate the same gamma rhythms. Now, whether the frequency of the transcranial near infrared is as critical as the um, trans optical blue light, I'm not sure. I mean, who can tell? They both seem to work. Um, now, Lu Lim, who has Violight, has two devices. One is 10 hertz for alpha, and the other is 40 hertz for gamma. And he claims that they do different things for different types of brain disorders. Um, you know, how important these frequencies are, again, remains to be determined. Interesting. Okay. And then how about as far as how does light therapy, we had mentioned, we had touched on uh, for psychiatric conditions, how is that, um, I guess, improving symptoms, say for someone who's depressed or has anxiety? Well, it seems to work fine. I mean, Paolo Cassano is the one who's really pushed that. And he now has a photobiomodulation clinic in the uh, MGH psychiatry department because a lot of people do not like antidepressant drugs, right? I mean, they sort of work, they take a while to work, they have a lot of side effects, and some people just don't respond to them at all. So I think Paolo thinks the treatment-resistant depression, photobiomodulation, is the treatment of choice. And for people that really do not like antidepressant drugs, Interesting. And does he have any hypothesis or do you have any hypothesis as far as like what, what is really going on to improve those symptoms? Is it the, the synaptogenesis, neurogenesis sort of stuff or improved yeah. mitochondrial function or all of the above? And, and even anti-inflammatory. I mean, and anti-inflammatory, right. But there's a lot of evidence that people with um, you know, chronic depression have higher levels of neuroinflammation. So yeah, I mean, who knows? Probably a bit of all of them. Right. Yeah, the, the neuroinflammation is an interesting one, especially maybe for, for some of the audience who's listening, because, uh, you know, people are very well acquainted with, uh, you know, just general inflammation. If you, you know, hit your knee and, and it swells up, and then, you know, I think more and more has been known about, uh, or just public awareness has increased about, um, kind of chronic inflammation and the problems with that. 
but uh, I, I think a lot of people are still a bit confused um, or at least not aware of, you know, brain inflammation is something like subclinical brain inflammation, right? Where it's not, not necessarily getting, you know, hit in the head with a baseball bat, you know, like a, a traumatic brain injury, but just kind of a low, low level inflammation, right? Yeah. And, and you know, that's one reason why you know, being obese and having a poor diet, why everybody says it's, in addition to all the other bad things it does, it could be bad for your brain because, you know, this definitely leads to low level chronic inflammation for sure. You know, and also things like chronic Lyme disease, right? Again, you know, that can lead to low level brain inflammation. Interesting. And as far as, uh, as far as brain inflammation, so how how are we able to really measure that? Is that brain scans? Is that I've seen like uh, like C reactive protein? I know there's some laboratories kind of looking at how that relates to I think it was depression specifically. What are the best ways to kind of measure neural inflammation at this point? Well, again, I don't think there's you know, a clearly accepted best way. I mean, certainly systemic markers you can measure things in saliva even you don't even need to take blood tests but you know how accurate and reproducible they are you i guess you can use pet scans for chronic inflammation but i don't think they're used really for this low level it's much more if there's some sort of focal lesion you want to see um you know obviously Brain scanning is a huge field, you know, and functional MRI is taken off in a, an enormous way. But, you know, everything is sort of correlated together. And it's not clear that low level brain inflammation is the cause of everything, even though sometimes it's been, it's been implied, implicated in everything. But, uh, sure. And that's kind of where I was where I was going with the question was I was kind of wondering if there's been any studies looking at, you know, using light therapy and then actually being able to see the reduction in neuroinflammation on, say, one of these, you know, PET scans. Well, I mean, it's certainly being shown in, in animal models, for sure. Um, you know, because an animal, you just kill the animal, take its brain out, and you look exactly what's going on. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Got a little harder to do that with uh, humans, huh? So I think people are just extrapolating that they will see the same effects in humans as they do in mice and rats. Right. And then can we, can we uh, touch on a little, I, I guess, go a little more in depth as far as what, you know, we, we know the brain that has this, you know, remarkable neuroplasticity um, where it's able to change and sort of rewire itself and, and grow new, uh, new neurons and new synapses. Um, but what what specifically can light therapy, what sort of cognitive functions has it been shown to be like most most effective for at improving? Well, I, th I think executive function and, you know, emotional regulation. They're, they're the, the, and we're here we're talking, yeah, I mean, pretty much even if you've got a brain disorder, you're going to be uh, likely to be deficient in one or both of these, um, you know, the chronic TBI folks, chronic stroke, a lot of it is cognitive function. Um, all the psychiatric things, a lot of it is emotion regulation, mood disorders. Um, but drug addiction is interesting. So the people are starting to look at photobiomodulation for drug addiction. And, and there the idea is that you know, if you get addicted, especially to opiates, your brain gets rewired, right? So there's a lot of aberrant pathways get established in your brain, which is why whatever you do, you can't get off drugs, you know? Um, so there's some evidence that photobiomodulation allows the brain to sort of rewire its pathways, if you want to put it like that. Very interesting. Huh. And then as far as we, we touched on the, the mitochondrial benefits, um, but can you talk a little about how 
why would improving, say, the brain's mitochondria result in, in some of these benefits? Well, I mean, the brain is basically run by its mitochondria. As, as I said earlier, you know, it, weight for weight, it uses way more energy than any other part of the body. Um, so getting the mitochondrial function uh, back to normal or possibly even above normal, who knows, but certainly back to normal and depressed mitochondrial function, again, is implicated in all these brain disorders. Right, right. And I've seen that, uh, you know, from both like the neurodegenerative side as, uh, of things as far as also the psychiatric side. So, so it could potentially benefit all of those. Right. And also, you know, they, they, it's a systemic effect that's fed by modulation. So when you shine light on the head, we don't for sure know that all the therapeutic light is going into the brain. Right, there's blood circulating in the in the scalp, and the blood can certainly absorb light. And for instance, platelets have a lot of mitochondria, so increasing platelet mitochondrial activity could circulate the benefits around the body. So my personal opinion is part of the benefit is the photons getting into the brain, into the cortex, and another part of the body part of the benefit is circulating blood. And then another thing you shouldn't forget is that the skull, like any bone, has got bone marrow in it. And these bone marrow has stem cells. And it's well known that putting photobiomodulation onto bones can mobilize stem cells from the bone marrow. So perhaps we're even mobilizing some stem cells from the bone marrow in the skull. Wow. That's actually one thing, yeah, I'd, I'd never heard about that. Because, I mean, that's something I think with, with stem cell injections, people are actually like taking, I mean, that's actually coming from the, the bone marrow sometimes, right? And then they're injecting that. So you're saying with light therapy, you could potentially actually just activate uh, the stem cells instead of necessarily needing sort of exogenous ones. And, and also they're your own stem cells, so they're much more likely to permanently engraft into the tissue where they need it than if you would inject exogenous stem cells where most of those, you know, only have a temporary effect. Right. So what have, tell me a little as far as like, what have been maybe the, the newest, most exciting findings, say from your your research labs or just research that you've seen, you know, with light therapy over the, say the past, you know, few years, past five years? I think the, the most exciting application is Alzheimer's. So as, as you know, there's an epidemic of Alzheimer's and, you know, there's been billions and billions of dollars in failed drug trials. All the big pharmaceutical companies have had big drug trials for Alzheimer's and almost without exception that failed. Although there was one recent one that was claimed to be a success. But, you know, so anything that works for Alzheimer's is a huge big deal. And, you know, the trials that have been done with photobiomodulation have only been small trials, you know, 10, 20 people at most, and not on a big scale and not randomized, double blind, placebo controlled. But the trials that have been done have had a remarkable effect. I mean, for instance, one trial, the benefit, the cognitive benefit was seven times bigger than the benefit with the large Aricept trial, which is the only wow. approved drug for Alzheimer's. So, you know, just shining a near-infrared light on your head could be seven times better than the best Alzheimer's drug that's out there. Wow. Which is really good. <laughs> So, yeah, I think that I think this is rapidly going to spread. I mean, I'm aware of a, you know, a few companies that are making photobiomodulation devices to put on the head for Alzheimer's, and we'll see how they go. Interesting. So, so it's kind of the uh, the animal models were very, uh, I guess, um, there was a lot of hope that it was going to translate into humans and we're still kind of, you know, waiting to fully see if, if that's going to be 
of benefit? Is that kind of how you see it? Right. I'm pretty sure it is going to benefit the humans. Now, you know, how long the benefits will last, you know, trials have been done over three months sort of thing. And, you know, the, the anecdotal reports of it was a remarkable improvement. So, you know, people that couldn't hold a conversation suddenly start being <laughs> able to converse and people who have to be fed can suddenly start using a knife and fork of their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it does make a big difference, but is it going to last for years of their life? Who knows? Right. That, that actually is a, an interesting thing I was just thinking about is, I mean, is that something like you, like how long do the benefits say if you, uh, you know, use one of these say brain photo biomodulation devices, um, so to treat Alzheimer's or something else, uh, are you just getting kind of the benefits like shortly after you actually do the session or is, are, are there actually, do we see like long lasting changes from this sort of therapy? Well, for, you know, a few months for sure, because that's been done. So nobody's really done it for years yet. You know, generally a trial will do treatment two or three times a week for three months. And over that time, they get steadily better. If the treatment has stopped, they get steadily worse again. So you're going to have to use it long term for sure. Now, whether the it, you know whether it will wear off. I mean, you know, these are old folks, so that eventually they're going to go downhill, right? I mean, you know, but you could probably give them a few years of much improved quality of life, almost certainly, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's, it would definitely be very impactful. Just, uh, you know, as you mentioned with Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative conditions, I mean, I've heard, you know, if they're basically saying if you don't die of heart disease at this point that, you know, Alzheimer's is going to, you know, almost definitely affect you. Well, I don't know about almost definitely, but certainly it's a huge, big deal. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And Parkinson's, the folks in Australia have had very good results with Parkinson's. Interesting. Is it, uh, are there different mechanisms in play, you think, there, as far as the potential, like the, the dopaminergic cells uh, coming back online or? Uh, it could be, yeah, it could be. I mean, you know, they, they've done both humans and animal models. And in the animal models, they certainly see reduced death of the dopam dopaminergic cells, for sure. In humans, what they see is improved performance, basically, better movement, better cognitive performance, and so on. I see. Okay. Interesting. I, I'm curious as far as a, a timeline, I should have asked you this earlier, but kind of how, how did you eventually move into uh, kind of getting into this field of light therapy? Um, okay, so as you said in the beginning, I was an organic chemist many right, years Right, right, so that transition. <laughs> and was working with photosensitizers, which are organic molecules like porphyrins and thalassinines and these sort of things. So, um, yeah, and then started to study PDT for all sorts of diseases with these photosensitizers. But then when you work in PDT, you're using red light to photoactivate these dyes, right? But as a control, you have red light alone. And then you notice that in the control cells or control animals that are just getting red light, something very interesting is happening. And it's usually the opposite of PDT. So PDT is designed to kill things. The photosensitizing dye and the light combine to produce reactive oxygen species that kill cells and kill bacteria and generally destroy things. In the control cells or animals that are just getting the red light, you see exactly the opposite. They stimulate proliferation and stimulates tissue repair and healing. So to some degree, if you have two 
<coughs> sort of complementary approaches. You've got PDT, which can kill nasty things. It can kill cancer and kill infections and destroy unwanted tissue. And then you've got photobiomodulation, which can heal things. It can reduce pain, reduce inflammation. You know, by choosing the appropriate one of these, you can probably treat all diseases with light. Interesting. Interesting. So you kind of made that uh, or realized that and then kind of got more into a deep dive kind of into the light therapy field. Right. Yeah, I think I think that photobiomodulation is a more actively growing field than photodynamic therapy. So photodynamic therapy has been known for about 50 years, you know, and it's used a bit for a few things, but it never really took off in a big way, which is a shame because it's uh, it's quite an exciting thing. But yeah, it's a bit more complicated than photobiomodulation. You have to have a photosensitizer, which is a drug, and it has to be tested for toxicology and get regulatory approval. And then you have to get the photosensitizing drug and the light to the target lesion at the same time, which is more challenging than just shining the light on the body. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Then how about, um, kind of lastly, I wanted to ask you, what are, what are the biggest things as far as the future of this field of photobiomodulation? What, what do you see, where do you see it going? Um, you know, what other, uh, say conditions or, or applications maybe that we haven't touched on, do you see it, it being used for in the future? So I think whole body photobiomodulation devices are coming in. So these are, sometimes they're like light beds that you can climb into like a sunbed. Um, sometimes they're large panels that you can stand in front of or even lie on top of. You know, so folks are starting to have these at home. Um, some of them are, fairly expensive, but now, you know, large LED panels are quite affordable. Um, and you can use these for general health and wellness, right? For, as you say, athletic performance, muscle function, recovery after exercise, possibly even weight loss, um, if you combine it with exercise, uh, you know, skin health, all sorts of general health and wellness applications and you know and then you've got the home use therapeutic devices helmets sort of flexible things you put around your joints and your limbs so i can see the the time when almost every household will have a sort of biomodulation device and some will have several you know they'll have a light bed and a light panel and a light helmet and how far away do you think we're we are from that well not that far i mean all these devices are out there on the internet you could go now and you could order yourself half a dozen different <laughs> biomodulation devices <laughs> you just need to get the message out there so people think it's worth worth doing. I mean, they're, they're not going to cost you a fortune, you know, a few hundred dollars here and there, but probably worth it, I think. Right. Well, you, you certainly have been working on, on getting the, the message out there. Um, uh, you know, I want to really thank you for, for coming on the show to discuss all of this stuff. Um, if people wanted to find out more about your work or, or get in contact with you, where, what sort of resources would you direct them to? Uh, well, get in contact, you just type my name into Google, I'm all over the place. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think the, the, the number of websites, some of them are quite good, you know. I mean, uh, uh, James Carroll has the Thor Laser website, which is quite good. It's got a lot of um, resources, publications, and things. Um, you know, Tuna and Hode in Sweden have a have a website which is very good as well. So, I mean, just a little bit of internet search and you'll find more than enough. Okay, and you have a, a couple books out too, right? Yeah. Just 
several books, yeah. Several books, right. Are some of those are geared towards more of a, a lay people audience? Not so much. No. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm going to be a best-selling author. <laughs> <laughs> but some of them are, are more accessible than others. I mean, we did a, a book for SPIE called the Tutorial Text, which is relatively accessible. Yeah, but I've also done a couple of fairly massive handbooks that uh, might be more than the average person could cope with. Sure. <laughs> right on. Well... Thank you so much, Dr. Hamlin, for coming on the show. Um, if you guys would like to connect with us, uh, Roscoe's uh, Wetsuit Podcast is the Instagram. Um, we're on YouTube, Roscoe's Wetsuit. Um, go ahead, like, and subscribe. We're also, the audio version is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, and iHeartRadio, anywhere you can find podcasts, we are on there. Um, so go ahead and check us out. Dr. Hamlin, thanks so much again. Well, thank you for the invitation. I quite enjoyed it. I usually quite like talking about this stuff.